have in our relationship with God, uh, in ev every relationship, but certainly in our relationship with God too, there are, there are ebbs and flows. There are, some days are better than other days, but all days are good days in a good relationship. Even though some days are better and, on, on, and some are a little worse, they're all good days. And, and so it is in our relationship with the Lord. There's, there's days that are just not the, it's a day, but you got to realize that all those days are good days because God has given to us eternal life. So even if I have a bad day, it's, it doesn't last forever. You gotta, you gotta, sometimes you have to push through a day and kind of get there, but it's okay. You got to re realize that with the Lord, my relationship with him, I have eternal life. So I'm, I'm never going to die. I'm always going to live. And the worst it's ever going to be for me is right now. Tomorrow will be better. The next day after that will be better. And, and I'm in, in this earth suit, and so the earth suit's not getting younger. It's, 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 it's getting older, but, but uh, I'm just getting closer to the strength that God has for me. I want to talk to you about building strong faith. We, we've been in a series called I Believe. And so God, I want you to get some illustrations and understandings of how to build this, this strong faith that God wants to develop in you. Remember this principle, faith in God. It, faith, spiritually speaking, is not derived or based on favorable outcomes. That's natural faith. Faith naturally that has a positive outcome in the future is great faith but it's, it's, it's natural, it's earthy uh, if it's a negative outcome it's called fear and you can have fear and nothing even, can even change, you're just, you're just afraid Oh my golly, what's going to happen? I don't understand. This is crazy. The, the United States is going to, we're, we're doing so many, I can't believe, come on. Nothing even happened. It's just all fear. You're, you have an outcome that's negative, and so it brings fear. An expectation. Or you can have expectation of good things, and it's faith or hope. But it's, all, it's natural. Spiritual faith is faith in God. It's not about an outcome. The outcomes will Will, will come and go, ebb and flow. It's not about an outcome. It's about God. It's about who he is to you. Now, when you walk with God and start building that relationship with God, you're going to get what God brings through the relationship. Uh, you know, the scripture says, evil companions corrupt good manners. In other words, if you're a pretty good person and you hang around with some yahoos, you'll become a yahoo. I mean, really, you just will. If, if you don't curse, but you hang around people that curse, you'll start cursing. Unless you've got a fundamentally strong um, aversion to, to filthy language. Because your mom beat you or you're something when you were a kid. <laughs> so now you, you won't go there. Other than that, you're going to become that that you're involved in. All right? Well, God is the great God. The more you hang with him, the more you spend time with him. The more the, the greatness of God starts appearing in you. The faithfulness of God starts appearing in you. The victories that God wins start appearing in your life. You start going, oh, I can, I can do this. I feel like, man, praise God. Because then you get the WDGW. I talked about that at the end of the service last week, that you've got you to find, to walk with God, to have great faith with God, building strong faith, you have to find the WDGW. And the W, you know what that stands for? W is what? Give me the D. Does God want? What does God want? In any, in any situation you're in, you've got to say spiritually now before the Lord, what do you want? What do you want to see happen? And he's not going to ask you to do extraordinary things. He's not going to tell you, oh, Abram, come sacrifice your son on Mount Moriah. 
He's not going to ask you to do that. He might ask you to slow down in traffic or something. <laughs> might ask you to give something away or sacrifice a little bit or serve somebody. But he's not going to ask you to do big things until you've mastered small things. You can't lift 400 pounds if you, can't, if you have never lifted 100 pounds. Things in the kingdom start small and grow big. So I'm going to give you um, five principles that build strong faith. Here's the first one. Faith and faithfulness. They are coupled together. Faith and faithfulness. It is easier to be faithful to God when you have strong faith in God. That's the truth for everything. Easier to be faithful to something that you that you're connected to when you have strong faith. So faith, to be, to be faithful to God, you have to have faith in God. If you have a car, let's say you drive your car and your car's brakes need work, and so your brakes fail 50% of the time. Half the time you press the brake, the brakes are gonna fail. You know, I, I'm not driving very fast in that car. In fact, I don't even mean drive in that car. If half the time I'm braking, I'm going to get failure. Half the time. I'm certainly not going in a rainy, dark day in Seattle's mountains. Not in that car. Why? I have no faith in it. When you build faith in God, you will start walking with God in ways you are not walking in him now, with him now. Faith. Now, here's what I love about faith. Um, it, it starts small and it grows big. Here's a second principle. Suffering and hardship. Now, I know you're not rushing to the, to the mall to buy the book on the greatness of suffering. The world doesn't, doesn't embrace suffering and hardship. But it is what it is. I mean, there is a component that God has put into suffering that was going to help your spiritual life quantum leap. And I'm going to say to you that if you'll embrace suffering and hardship, you're going to be a super Christian. You're going to be super. You'll be powerful. It's going to release some, some strength inside of you you don't currently have. And it's going to refashion your Christianity so that it's genuine. Your faith is genuine. Right now, you know, our faith as Christians in the, in the common faith that we have now is not really very strong very powerful. It's weak. We don't do miracles. We don't pray things. We don't establish. We got the same level of uh, discord in our own homes as they have out in the, in the homes of those who are not born again. Just crazy. Same poverty, same disease, same, 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 same. Why? Because we are not living the principles that God has established Because as everybody. I'm not talking about you particularly, but just as a general rule. So let's just flip that. Let's just change it. We can change it. I'm not saying that to say, oh, my, the world is, is so bad. It's not. Let's just change it. We have the power to change what we, to establish what we need to have established and to bring some change. Strength is built through life's struggles. You're going to get stronger by using your faith through the struggles of life. Um, in everybody's life, there's something called pain. We all have pain. Everybody has pain. I have pain. You have pain. We all have pain. Physical pain, emotional pain, some, sometimes financial pain. You always have pain. But you're going to grow. Your faith will grow through the struggles. You're not going to give up. You're not going to roll over. You're going to be stronger, and you're going to take somebody else who's watched your whole life, and they're going to take confidence in their experience by watching your experience. And they're going to say, I can do this. I can do this. For me, I used to sit there and watch the Rams play in the Coliseum when I was a little kid. Wanted to play ball. Had, had that desire, and I watched a guy named Harold Jackson. He was a receiver for the Rams. He was a fast guy. Wasn't very big, but he, was, he could play. He was a great player. So he gave me, he gave me faith. Gave me confidence I could meet him. I mean, I could, I could be that guy uh, until I actually met him. Met him, we became friends. So I'm just saying God will develop that in, into you. 
Here's your third one, prayer and fasting. Faith and faithfulness. It is easier to be faithful to God when you have strong faith in God. Suffering and hardships. Strength is built through life struggles. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting are two of life's dynamic duos. There are dynamic duos, and prayer and fasting go together. And they're really powerful. And if you learn the secret of prayer and fasting, it's going to elevate your experience with God and your experience in life. Prayer and fasting. So there are, there are lots of great dynamic duos, duos. You know, Batman and Robin are one. And peanut butter and jelly. Got a peanut butter and jelly is like, dang, peanut butter and jelly. When I was a kid, I lived on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I loved them. Now it's like almond butter and honey <laughs> with a gluten-free biscuit. Prayer and fasting. We'll look at that in just a second, the, the power of those two that come together. Here's number four, sinking your words and your works. Word and works. When you live what you say and say what you live and it's built on your faith in God, it will make you unstoppable. Talking about being limitless. It's the link between your words and your works. Why is that? Because when you declare it, there's a part of you inside of you that thrives on congruency. Or else you're a liar. And even a liar knows he's lying. And even he cannot stop the inner workings for congruency, which is why you can take a lie detector test and a liar can fail the test. Because in him, even though he's saying, I'm lying, I'm lying, I know I'm lying, but I need you to believe me because it's bad for me if you figure out I'm lying, you still, you still will de deny yourself. People will, you'll look at them. You don't need a test. You say, you're lying. No, no, I'm not. Why would you even say that? I'm not lying. You say, you're lying. I can just tell. I can look at you. Look at your eyes and look at there. You're sweating. I'm not sweating. I'm sweating because it's hot in here. I don't, you know, you're lying. Your whole body will betray you. Why? Because your, your body wants congruency. And when you make a decision that you're going to live congruent with God, that your words and your actions are in alignment, you become unstoppable. Because God will do things through you because he can trust you that he won't normally do. Hmm. I'm going to say it to you again. I want you to catch that. God, God will do things. Now listen, you, can, you have this power in your hands. God will do things through you that he normally won't do if he can get you in alignment so that your words and your actions are the same. So you find out what does God want and you begin to speak that into existence, your, your life, your whole life will begin to line up your relationships, uh, your body, your resources will all line up to what God wants because you're in agreement with that. And now your actions and your words are in sync. And next, you know, it's just a matter of time. Then it's done. It's a done deal. Here's number five is potent partnerships. Things you can't do by yourself, you can do through your partners. Things you can't do alone, you can accomplish through your partners. Partnerships are great. You ought to develop some, part, some great partnerships. You ought to say to the Lord, give me wisdom so I can develop some great partners. Because partners help you. Jesus couldn't do what he did. He had a role without partners. He could come die on the cross and show us that he is a savior and rise from the dead. But he's not moving the gospel around the globe. Who did that? Peter, James, John, Paul, um, and, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on for thousands of years. And you know what? We're part of the, and so on. This is our hour. This is our watch. Peter, James, and John, those guys are going like this in the heavens. Oh, come on, man. Let's go. Do this thing. Walk with God. 
Preach, dude. Lay your hands on the sick. Have some faith, man. Use your faith to do something extraordinary. Isn't the God, God is the great God. And you're sitting there thinking, how do I get through the day? And God wants to do extraordinary things through you. Powerful things that have never happened. And, you're, and you can get overwhelmed by that, but you shouldn't be. Because God will meet you wherever you are. God will meet you wherever you are. So let's look at faith and faithfulness. Okay, Jesus rebukes the demon. We, we talked about this last week when the disciples are there driving this, this demon out and they're having a difficult time getting it done. But Jesus rebukes the demon. It comes out of him and the child was cured that very hour. The disciples come to Jesus privately after the, the occurrence and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief or your lack of faith or the weakness in your faith. They didn't, they didn't have no faith in God. They had faith in God, but they just weren't sure. They had re realized they were driving a car that the brakes failed 50% of the time, and it was failing. So Jesus says, why? He tells them, because of your, un your lack of faith. For surely I say to you, watch this, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the mustard seed's a very small seed. It's, he, he describes it as the least of all the seeds. If you have faith as a faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. It, can you say it with me, it will move? It will. He didn't say it might move, it should move, it's possible to move. If you have faith as a mustard seed, small amount of faith. What I love about faith is once you start working with it, it'll grow. Move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. First of all, let's look at faith. Um, faith is when you grab faith and have faith in God, remember defining faith, faith is in God. When you have faith in God, your faith in God is designed to grow. So God will take you through more experiences, um, showing that he's faithful. He'll do things for you that, that only he can do. And, you'll, and you'll, your faith in God is going to grow. You're going to start going to God for everything. I go to God all the time. Sometimes I had to learn that, though, uh, because sometimes I would handle it myself. I didn't want to bother God. My golly, he's got the whole world to run. I can handle this. He's busy. He got stuff doing. And plus, if I ask him, he doesn't do half the stuff I ask him anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, I, mean, I kind of feel like I'm on this by myself, right? And then, and then I would just mess up. I'd mess up. I'd have failures. I'd struggle with it. I'd get myself in a bad situation. And then he would come in and deliver me anyway. And then he would say, why don't you call me at the beginning instead of calling me at the end? Okay, I will next time, Lord. And then the next time I would do the same stupid thing I did the previous time, right? Until I had to learn a different way. I learned, well, what do you want? What do you want in this outcome? What do you want this to be? How do you want this to go? I started building my faith. And then I became faithful to God's way. Listen, I started building my faith in God's way. And I became faithful to God's way. God's way is a way of love. God's way is a way of mercy. God's way is a way of giving. God's way is a way of serving. God's way is a way of overcoming. God's way is a way of prevailing. God makes a way when there's no way. God honors your word when you speak it because you spoke it. I'm just this way. There were things I would declare and say, and all of a sudden God would bring them to pass. And I was like, boo, God, what, what are you doing? He says, you said you said. So I started having faith. My faith in God grew, and my faithfulness grew. So I can move mountains. Now, what is mountains here in the scriptures don't represent a physical mountain, it represents kingdoms. There are, there are certain things that are, that are in your way to establish what God desires to establish, certain mountains certain structures that the enemy has placed. And you have to be able to deal with those mountains. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the demonic adversary or the structure that's counter to the desire of God. Speak to it. If you don't speak to it, it's going it's to just stay there. 
Why don't you speak to it? And you can't speak words that strengthen it. You have to speak words that move it. Give me an example. I was speaking at a university years back, and as I came in, the, the guy who picked me up at the airport, who was uh, the, one of the leaders of this organization that had brought me in, and their offices were next door to this bar, topless club. And I was like, dude, are you kidding me? Uh, he said, well, you know, da -da -da. He, he, he said, walk me through some stuff. And I was like, let's, let's just move this place. Let's get this down the road. He said, what do you mean? I said, you'll stay in agreement with me. Father, in the name of Jesus. This, is not, this, this organization is not established by you. It's just wickedness. It's perversion. I pray that you would save all those girls and all those guys inside there. Go inside there. Send, we send the Holy Spirit and the warrior angels to go save all those people. And this place was shut down, closed down, be done. Done. Finished. You're out. You're out of business now in Jesus' name. So I said, let's go finish what we had to do. I came, did the stuff I, I went to do and finished that. Spoke at the university. I was I was down there to speak at, came back about probably six months later, three to six months, I don't remember the exact time. And when I came back, the guy said to me, that place is closed. <laughs> it was just a mountain. It was just something the enemy has established. I'm just telling you what, you, you gotta come back in your own house. You've got a, a trail. Of, of hurt and brokenness and fear and worry and doubt, just move the mountain. Move, move the mountain. Speak to that. Speak to that situation. Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm praying for strength to go through it. Why? Why pray for strength to go through that when you should move it? Well, we've always, in our family, we've always had, we've always had this blood disease. We've always had this this fear we've always had, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just been, it's just, that's just, that kind of defines who we are. Why? Why let that define you? Why not let God define you? Move the mountain. If you have a little mustard seed faith can move that mountain, use your faith. Use your faith in God and watch what God does. He is the great God. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting has some unique um, things that it will produce for you. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. Uh, suffering and hardships, James 1, 2, and 4. Let's talk about suffering and hardships. May God give you great faith and build your faithfulness so that you're always faithful to everything God asks you to do. And the more faithful you are with small things, the more God rewards you with big things. If you're faithful with small things, he thinks you're faithful with big things. And so he will reward you by giving you bigger and better assignments and, and the great things that God provides. What builds faith, though, is, is suffering. Suffering and hardships are important components that build faith. James 1, 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many, how many people have been doing that one? Man, you get into real hardship, it's struggling, I mean, you sick, sickness, whatever, just tough, it's pain, pain on top of pain. And you're like, yes, hallelujah, praise the God. How many people do that? Two. That's tough. That's tough, man. I'm just telling you, it's tough for me too. When you get into a trial, a situation that's hard, it's just, it just almost counter to us to rejoice in it. But here's what the Lord says. Count it a joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, watch, that the testing of your faith produces patience. The struggle is there just to develop your strength so that you overcome, so that you learn how to be still. Not act based on fear or uncertainty, but to be still. Let patience have its complete work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking, help me church, nothing. 
I'm talking about a life habit where you walk with God and your faith in God is so strong. Your faith in God is so strong and he walks with you that when, you're, when things that move other people don't move you. They don't move you. You're going to die, man. You're not going to make it. I hear what you're saying. I'm going to make it. No, you're not. Watch my lips move. I'm going to make it. My father has ordained. He has established. And it doesn't look like that at all. It looks like completely opposite. And you might be in the middle of an incredible trial yourself. But when you're in the midst of that trial, you're moving the mountain. So the mountain can't overwhelm you. That demonic activity can't stop you because you can move it. How do I move it? With just a mustard seed faith. You got to have strong and powerful faith. No, you got to have a little mustard seed. Just use the seed, man. Use the word that God has given you. Speak the word into your environment because that's your metron, your measure of rule. You want God to come in and God's coming in to empower you. Speak to yourself. Speak to your, your body. Come on. And you'll watch how faithful God is to do what he does. Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, for you. Jesus tasted death. He, he died so that you would live. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. For he made everything and everything is for him. You are for him. In bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. How does it get perfect? Suffering. I'm just telling you, sufferings and hardships are part of it. Suffering is like just pain. It's just a short term. It doesn't last forever. Hardships are sufferings that are extended. So you might be hungry and you just get food. If, 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 but if you live in a, a place that doesn't have food, which we can't even imagine that in America. But there are places on this planet that people are starving to death. Don't have clean water. It's amazing. We can't, even, we can't even comprehend that in America because we have an abundance of everything natural. Hardships is when kids are dying because they can't eat or they get bit by bugs and the disease from the bugs kill them because they can't get into a place of safety and security. That's hardships. Do you know that God has equipped you to snap hardships, to completely break them, to destroy them? But you're, you're going to learn how to, before you're able to do that, before you're able to lift 200, you've got to lift 100. Before you're able to give $2, you've got to give $1. Because you develop a habit and you get stronger as things goes on. Now, as you're going through it, it's just tough. But the outcome of it will be you lack nothing. As you're going through it, you're like, oh, well, God, this, this class is so hard, and the teacher doesn't like me. Stop whining about that teacher who doesn't really care about you. I love all, she's been teaching for 10 years. Now she picked you out out of 10 years of teaching. Come on. She's sure you're in hardship. You're tough, you're in a little suffering time. You can push through that. The word here that we just read in verse 9, but we see Jesus. But, but, tip it, but is a conjunction. It, it kind of connects things together. Um, you know, uh, you can't say, well, and I really love you, but. Well, you know some stuff is coming behind the but. But I don't like the way you do this, and I don't particularly care for it, and da 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 You know. So but has, is a conjunction. It connects two things together. So when you started here, Hebrews 2.9, but, 
we see Jesus, we have to see what happened before Hebrews 2.9. So I want you to journey with me back to Hebrews 2.6. Uh, but one testifies in a certain place saying, this one that testified is, is David. It's King David, who is a mighty king. And David's the one that sees the Ark of the Covenant in a field, a tent, and he has a palace. So he decides he's going to build God a house. And God says, I'm going to build you a dynasty because that was in your heart because your faith was to build me a house. I'm using my faith and I'm going to build you a dynasty. And so David is like, wow. He didn't know that about God. He didn't know that's how God does, how his actions are, that he rewards super abundantly your faithfulness. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him. Now, he's talking about you. He's talking about humanity. So this is you, unless you're not human. Then we have another conversation. But <laughs> You have made him a little lower than the angels, the Elohim. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over, over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So you're designed, by God's design, you're designed to be in charge, to overcome, to prevail, to be strong, to be mighty, to win. That's his way. That's his way for you. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion, and put you in charge. Come on, that's his way. That's his way. I don't know, I'm just... I'm tired, I'm lonely, I just, I don't have anything. Stop, stop, stop. Stop saying those things and get in agreement with that. Get in agreement with what God has. That's his way. His desire is for you to overcome, for you to prevail. For it was fitting for him for whom all things, no, I'm sorry. Let me jump into uh, verse 8. So you have put all things in subjection, 2.8, under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. My boss, my spouse, or my, my children. Well, I don't even like Washington, the, the rain. I mean, all things are all things. So either you can do something about it or you can't. Watch. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see yet. We do not yet see all things put under him. So you're, you're going through your life. And you're thinking, man, I appreciate that, Pastor G, but there's a whole bunch of issues and challenges and struggles and stuff in my personal life that is not under my feet. It's kicking my tail. So then you read verse 9. But we see Jesus. I'm designed by God's design to overcome but I'm dealing with all the drama of life. And then Jesus. And then what steps into my world is Jesus. And when Jesus steps into my world, he overcomes. He causes me to overcome. He causes us to prevail in ways you have never prevailed before. Why? Because I got a little mustard seed faith called Jesus. And that faith is so strong, even though it's tiny, it can move any demonic mountain that I'm faced with out of the way. Dude, unstoppable. So you need to go to beliefs and you need some resources to go there? Call that resource in. We rebuke the devourer that tries to eat the resource and I call that resource in. I mean, I'm just saying, you might as well call it in. Or you might as well not. Oh, why would you not? It's counterproductive to what you're called to do. So you should call it in. 
You say, Lord Jesus, get with your wife and say, I call this money in. And, t- and, tell, and tell him what you're calling in. I mean, you can call the money in and it'd be $10. Eh, no. <laughs> call in what you need. Because you're not, you're not uh, doing what you want unless this is your desire and not his desire. If it's his desire, what does God want? And you know that's a sin you there because that's been in your heart. Then you should say to the father, I'm calling this money in. I'm calling the partnerships in. I'm calling the resources in. I'm moving the demonic mountains away and I'm establishing the wisdom and power of God. Come on. Somebody say amen to that. So in the, in the process, there, there's some suffering and hardship, but it's just going to make you stronger because it leads you to prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is huge. Prayer and fasting is a great um, resource in the lives of a believer. If you're a believer in Christ, you need prayer and fasting. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Daniel is having this vision in the first year of his reign. I, Daniel, understood the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel gets that Daniel, who has come into Babylon, taken captive because Israel has been in rebellious to God. So God used Nebuchadnezzar to come in and, and beat up Israel for a little bit and take them captives. And so now Daniel goes to, to Babylon as a young man, but now he's an older man. And he understands time frames and prophetic utterances that came from other prophets before him. And he realizes that a shift is apparent. I can shift this. You got you to recognize certain times and seasons. This is a time and season that God's establishing his way in the Northwest and he's using us. So God's going to bring and usher in some grand new things that have never been here before in a spirit of holiness and faithfulness and, and some of the drama, and I mean cataclysmic drama that goes on in Washington is going to be stopped. Some of the struggle that people have, multitudes of homelessness here, that's over. It's going to stop. It's going to be over. We're going to solve it. We're going to bring solutions. God's going to bring other people in. And and the whole region is going to be flipped from a place of hardship, suffering and hardship, to the peace and joy. Great joy in Yeshua. Great joy in Jesus. Do you believe you can usher that in? Can somebody say amen? amen? Now, here's God's design. God's design is for you to do that. But you're going to have to spend some time in prayer and fasting to make that happen. Here's what Daniel did. He set his face towards the Lord God, verse 3, to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He jumped past prayer and fasting. Prayer and supplications. Prayer is talking to God. Supplication is intercession before God. So he's interceding before God. Why? Because he knows what does God want. He already knows what God wants. God's already prophesied that through Jeremiah that Jerusalem would be restored. And this rebellion that we've been in, the penalty for that is over. And now we can prosper. Oh, come on. So he's praying and fasting. He's interceding before the throne. Uh, Fasting biblically is not eating. Biblical fasting is not eating. Uh, I hate to tell you that. (laughs) But when you go on a fast, you say, I'm fasting. It means you're not eating. Doesn't mean I'm skipping desserts or I'm not eating my favorite chocolate pie more than once. You're not fasting in between meals. I'm fasting between breakfast and lunch. I'm fasting. I don't want that, I'm fasting. Give me that in about a couple hours and I'll be good. Fasting, biblically, is not eating. And so you might pull the Daniel fast, but let me just tell you about Daniel. That wasn't part of his structure. They, you have to extrapolate some ridiculous things to try to pull the Daniel fast. Because that's built on 
Daniel saying, I ate no pleasant bread. I ate no meat. And he gives the things that he didn't eat that were things that everybody always ate. He wasn't saying anything that's not on the list, I ate that. That's what the Daniel fast is. I, I, because meat's on the list, I'm not eating meat. Because this pleasant things, I'm not eating that. But anything that's not on this three or four things he said, I can eat all that. Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but that's not a biblical fast. And you're not going to get the results that Daniel gets unless you're doing what Daniel does. So right now, it's just tough to fast when you love to eat. And the first couple of days, you anticipate the fact when you're saying no to food. You want so-and-so? No. Can you eat this? No. You want a cracker? No. And your body's inside saying, hey, fool, eat something. <laughs> Shoot. Man, come on, I'm hungry, eat. And then it starts playing tricks on you because you can smell stuff from three miles away. Ooh, oh, that smells good. But you got an agenda. And you're going to break some things in the spiritual realm and move that mountain. Do you want to eat or move the mountain? I want to move the mountain. I got to move this forward because I'm, I'm pressed with what God wants. So here's what Daniel does. He, he prays, he intercedes, he fasts in sackcloth, which was a uh, you know, you're in old school, you remember the bag of potatoes used to come in, a, in that, there weren't those smooth plastic bags we see now. They were rough bags. Man, eh? Sackcloth is just a representation of a struggle, difficulty, a challenge. When you're going some time of prayer and fasting, it's not happy days. You're just struggling a little bit. And ashes. Ashes is completely um, humble, broken. And ash is a re result of a fire consuming all the life out of it. And now nothing's left but ashes. You want to move the mountains that are before you. Prayer, supplication, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandment. Let me just pause for a second there. Uh, if you're going to get God to move for you, one of the things you should start with is declaring to him how, how great he is, how awesome he is. You know, in fact, that's just a human secret as well because God created all of us, even though everybody doesn't reflect him. If, if you want to get something from somebody, start with kindness. Start with kindness. Start being nice. Start saying some nice things to them. Hey, my friend, good to see you. Bless you, man. I miss, miss seeing your face. Hey, how, what's been going on? Start there. Don't start. You know what? You are, you're a loser. <laughs> and you never honor your word. Now I'm sick and tired of you. Hey, can you help me? Uh, I'll punch you. Come on. Only Christians would do that. Only somebody who just who just loves God, will take all your insults and still give you back good. What people do in the world is they'll give you back whatever you give them. So at least be smart enough to start with some good. <laughs> give them good. I don't like this guy. He's no good. Doesn't honor his word. He's loud. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know, but give him good. Give him good. You want something from that teacher? Give her good. You want something good from that coach? Give him good. You want something strong from this relationship? Start with good. So here's Daniel. Daniel says, oh, Lord, great and awesome God. He's going to declare who God is. Then he declares what they've done. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebuffed and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So, so Daniel doesn't get to a place where he justifies the behavior. He confesses it. It's, listen, you made a mistake, confess it. Don't try to hide it, confess it. If I may... Be quick to repent, quick to con confess. It's a key in a great marriage. If you've got a relationship and you've got, it's a little icy, be quick to repent. Find your mistake. Don't justify. Don't pull your sword and take, 
take, we're going to, I'm going to defend this ground against your spouse. You never, you refuse to. Stop, you're going to lose. You're losing. Put that sword back and, and, and get into agreement. It's the same way with God. God, where have you been? How come you haven't been faithful? Why are we struggling? Why are we in captivity? He didn't go there. He goes here. We have sinned. We have rebelled. But you, but you God, are still, you are righteous. Oh, Lord, righteousness, verse 7, belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all of Israel, to those who are near, those who are far off. He includes everybody because he's going to petition God and he wants everybody included. If I'm going to get a victory, I want my whole family to get the victory. I don't want three of us. I want all of us. If we're going to get a victory in this house, I want everybody to get the victory. I want everybody. Everybody's been here. Everybody's coming here. People have been here in the past. People have been here for a moment. Those who haven't been here, we're going to claim the victory for them. So Daniel includes them all. Hmm. In verse 9, he says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants to prophet. So, you know, rebellion, he, he, he acknowledges that. But he also acknowledges this. God, you, you, you have mercy. You're a merciful God. He reminds God of how great he is and how wonderful he is. Now, watch this. What he's doing is he's in supplication. He's in prayer and supplication. He's fasting. He's, he's, he's got the clothes of affliction on him. As he's struggling. It's not easy. And he sees himself as just the vessel. Oh, God. It's not his, it's not, that's not his way all the time. He just, it's his way here. Because he's trying to get something from the Lord. And he's interceding based on the prophetic word that God has already delivered. He knows what God wants. Let me, let me jump down to verse 14. Therefore the Lord has kept this disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, though we, will not, we have not obeyed his voice. And now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name. He's, he's, he's uh, in a good way buttering God up. You're bad, God. You know, you're awesome, God. You brought us. You delivered us. Even though we've sinned and we've done wickedly, we recognize that. Oh, Lord, according to your righteousness, don't, don't deal with us based on who we are. Deal with us based on who you are. I pray let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to those around us. This is, man, we're in bad shape, God. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your faith, your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. It's in a bad situation. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. I'm not appealing to you because I'm good. I'm appealing to you because you're good. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. This is your stuff. This is your city, Seattle. You assembled us here together as a people because you love this city. And you love all these people. You've called them to be set free and healed and restored. And we are here for that call. Yes. Mm. Here's what happens. Now, while I was speaking, verse 20, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel... The angel, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time 
of the evening offering. While he is praying, and he has been praying, Gabriel breaks through and goes, oh, I got a word. And when he begins to deliver that word, it's set. May you learn the secret of walking with God so that God can send you his word. And it changes everything. So you move some mountains and change some things. Words and works, James 2.14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith alone, faith in God alone, save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, and, but do not give them the things they need for the body, what, what does it profit them? How does it profit somebody to say, God bless you, bless you, brother, I don't have any food. Yes, and the Lord bless you. You don't have any food. I'm naked. Oh, yes, I can see that. Find some clothes. Why not be the answer? Why not demonstrate your words by your works? Someone will say, you have faith, verse 18, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, what faith without works is dead? That faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac his own son? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. Do what you say. Say what you do. Declare the word of God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him on his record for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You want to build intimacy with God? This is the way. You see, that man is justified by works and not by faith in God alone. Because your faith moves you to certain actions that are righteous before God. So I'm going to close with this in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Potent partnerships. Now the multitudes of those who believe were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone... Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands, of houses, sold them and brought the the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. When we create partnerships that that are selfless, we become unstoppable as a people. can't get there without that because it's become just a a group of individuals not a team When you function together as a team which is not about you it's about us then together we can do extraordinary things we develop potent partnerships that's what Jesus did Jesus changed the world because of what he did but also through his partnerships great partnerships God gives us opportunities to do that and if we do it we prevail Say the word gave me a mandate, and here's a mandate. Before you leave today, 100 push-ups need to be done on this altar. And I've sanctified this altar, and I want some labor, some works to happen. And I, I'm, I, want you, I want you 100 push-ups need to be done on this altar. So since I'm a, one of the leads here, I recognize that word, so I get down to, uh, to start doing push-ups. Because before we leave, so I do one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I, I start. Listen, I, 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 start, I start getting tired. But I, I got 90 more to do. Or 90 that needs to get done. So I'm catching my breath, but I realize, hey, it is what it is. Because 
It's just me. Now I'm telling you, God wants to develop, come on young man, some potent partnerships. So we're doing 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 and 90. And then we find that we're doing more than enough. That's the overflow that comes in the kingdom of God. But there's an abundance and there's more than enough. And every need is met. Now watch this. When we learn to live like that together, consistently, we become unstoppable. There's no need, be no lack. We'll speak the word of God and it will come to pass before your face. God will do what only God can do because of the power of what we do together. Young and old, male and female, rich and poor, it doesn't matter because we're in this together. And it's not so much what you do alone, it's what we do together. And your part makes a huge difference. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping and serving. It's awesome. Yeah. Go ahead. Come on. Good work. Praise God for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your faithfulness to your sons and daughters. Let an anointing be released in us that has unmeasurable, unmeasurable faith in you, God. That we always trust you, always believe you. That the mountains that come against us that are demonic will be moved. And we would establish the mountains that are righteous and they'll be firm and fixed. Help us to always overcome. Things that are overwhelming us now, we ask that you would show us that reality of that obstacle. And it is not a mountain. It is a, a hill, a pebble. And because we speak to it, it's easily dislodged. May Father, I ask that you dislodge anything in our, any of our lives and you to come to terms with this that is against your desire for us. Whether it be emotional or financial or physical, we ask for healing and restoration and peace and joy. But equally as important, God, or even more is the multitudes that haven't given their life to you. We want them born again. And we know that our mission, our assignment is to witness the love of God to them, for them. So we choose to model that. If you haven't given your life to Yeshua, to Jesus as the Lord of your life, then right now, you're ready. You're saying, man, I need to, I need to change some things in my life. Just stay right where you're seated and just lift up your right hand. And I'm going to pray with you, and God's just going to seal some things in your life. If you haven't given your life to Jesus and you're ready to do that, just lift up your right hand. If you're watching me online, you've ripped up your hand. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? If you're online, just lift up your hand. And you, I can't see you, but God sees you. And we want, we want God to do something extraordinary for you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? There are, there are people in your world. Here's what I want you to pray for. I'm praying for those who are giving their life to Jesus here today. It's, Great transformation. I want you to start praying as I'm praying with him, and I want you to come in agreement with people in your world, your family, your friends, co-workers, maybe some of your enemies, some, some, just some people that are against you, that they would be flipped today. That this would be the season that God changes them, that they come to Jesus. We're going to pray for those who are online and those here in the house 
who are accepting the Lord as the Lord of their life. And I want all of you who are born again to join me in this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, right now, I commit myself to you and to your way. Forgive me for my sins, my mistakes, my failures. I ask that you erase them. The evidence of my mistakes are gone. The evidence of my sins have been removed. I am clean and holy and righteous in your sight. Thank you, Jesus. I receive eternal life. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me your ways. It is sealed and settled forever for me. Amen. 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 A great thing. Great thing. If you are in the house and you pray that prayer, um, I got some resources we want to give you at the end of the service. So we're going to receive our offering in just a second. Then you can come up front and we'll meet you right here and get you some resources just to bless you and thank you. And uh, if you're watching online and you gave your life to the Lord, there an email. What's, what's the email address? Info, info at overcomercc.org. Info, I-N-F-O, at overcomercc.org. And send the, us that email. We'll make sure we get some things uh, to you in the mail so that you can participate. Thank you, Jesus. Ushers, come and serve us. We want to receive our offering, the first fruits that belong to the Lord, tithes and steps of faith, global missions. What a, what a great work, both locally and globally, that you guys are doing. It's really impacting um, I wouldn't say thousands of lives, but it really is bigger than that. Uh, it wouldn't be too much to say millions of people are impacted as you go through the layers of, of, of things we have given and served and blessed and strengthened and preached and taught, um, sometimes in very adverse environments where you're not sure if you're going to get out of there, but, but God is faithful. From, from Cambodia and Vietnam and Southeast Asia all the way to Israel and Middle East and Europe, Africa, uh, from Tacoma, all around this entire region, that, that the name of the Lord be honored because of your faithfulness, and it is honored. Father, as we give today tithes, offerings, steps of faith, and unique things that you've called us to give. Uh, we ask you to release a spirit of abundance on us, even as these men and women are up doing push-ups because you asked us to. So we ask that you release a level of abundance in our life, that that be symbolic of our willingness to give, to be the difference makers in the lives of those around us, our words and our works are synonymous. In Jesus' name, amen.